together. Mm. Now these things, verse 6, became our examples. What did they become? Our examples. So we can't say we didn't know. It just means we didn't look for examples. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them did also complain and were destroyed by the destroyer. You know what that tells me, people? Satan don't usually show up in our house until he's got a reason to. Mm. No wonder Philippians 2.14 says do everything without complaining or grumbling. It ain't saying so that you look good and so that no good won't come to your house. Come oh, y'all got quiet. So y'all love grumbling, complaining that much? I told you, if you don't grumble, you probably won't stumble. That means you have a different perspective. Now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Father, thank you for this word. I pray I can speak as one spoken to. Holy Spirit, have your way with us. Let the purifying process continue in our hearts tonight. I pray that what Jesus did for us, we can see, we can celebrate, we can honor, we can acknowledge, and we can also leave from this place a living testimony of the compassionate love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I pray that before we take communion tonight, that we'll reflect over our lives and remember how many times I was lost but found. How many times death came, but you yeah. made it pass over. Yes. How many times I tried to walk away, but you came and got me. I love you and I thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Slap your neighbor, high five, say there's healing power in communion. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe see them. Some of y'all ain't got the rhythm. I saw you try to slap a high five. You totally missed their hand. Amen. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. You got to have some examples in there. You got to find somebody with some soul. Amen. Oh, <laughs> uh, don't get racist either. I know people always look at me when the table. We had dramas. They talk about we got a dancing scene. Gerald, you're going to be out there. No, 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 no. <laughs> See that right there? See, that tells me you don't know enough about humanity to know. Just because I'm black don't mean I can dance. Right? Because I can't dance. Can't hold me. People think all black people can dance. Yeah, look at y'all. Look like, you can't dance. That's what it is. It's just like when we used to have the thing. Uh, they said, now, we do got, but well, we got carne asada. We got carnitas. But, oh, Brother Gerald, I think we might have some greens, some ribs, and chicken. Oh, yeah. I'm like, well, what makes you think I want? I might want some carne asada. I might want some carnitas. I might. I don't just want chicken automatically. <laughs> then they look at you when it's watermelon. They're like, <laughs> I brought watermelon. I'm like, good. Come my wife can tell you, I, I just started eating watermelon three years ago, and one of the things we did at Hagen Park. I had a complex the whole time. Well, why don't ask me for watermelon? I don't like watermelon. <laughs> but then I ate some watermelon, Dre. I think we were playing dominoes, and I slipped yeah. up. We were like, I ate the pup, turn them over. I was like, yeah, come on. It was a pup, they were, what's a watermelon pasta? That's right, I'm doing that. I'm like, that's good. What's that? They're like, that's watermelon. I'm like, oh. Maybe it is in my DNA. That was refreshing. My God. I want more of that. Hey, Amen. I don't care what people think. I found out I like watermelon. Come on. Ain't nothing wrong with it. <laughs> so many people suffer unnecessarily because they haven't been instructed in certain areas of Scripture. How many can say amen? Amen. See, many people think the Old, Old Testament is not for us. Come on. They think a lot of stuff in the New Testament is unnecessary for us. See, the Old Testament... It's just God establishing his will. The New Testament is God fulfilling that will that he established. That's why the Bible says in Matthew 5 that all things were fulfilled in Jesus. All things. But guess what? Jesus was only on the earth for three and a half years. 
There are some things that were left undone that God said is fulfilled in Jesus. That means Jesus didn't have to do it. Some of it was left for you and me to do it. And he says, as you go through life and you do these things, remember what I've done for you. Remember how you were in your dry place, your desert, your wilderness. Because a lot of us think the wilderness is negative. I said it's necessary. But you'll argue and say it's negative, but I'll still tell you it's necessary. It's necessary. It's, ne it's not negative, it's necessary. See, it's in the wilderness that I learned who he was. It was what I couldn't do for myself that I found out what he could do for me. Now, we always say, well, we shouldn't be looking at what God can do for us. Yes, we should. Listen, if we're called sons and daughters, if you can't discover the provision and the protection that your father can provide, you won't look at him as a father. You'll use him as somebody who just gets you what you want. Uh-oh. And so we find ourselves in situations and wildernesses, and that's where God wants us at. That's where God says, I'm going to show you that I can protect you in situations like this. Because there was an illustration I saw one time that a man escaped from his captors, and he chose rather than to cut through the forest to cut through the desert. Now they said, we got him now. He should have went through the forest because in the forest it's not as, uh, as harsh and arid as the, you know, as the desert. So he goes through the desert. And there he is going through the, But he learned something from somebody else that was captured from the desert. While he was locked up, he learned that if you're ever in the desert, there ain't going to be nothing to drink. So what do I do? Well, everywhere you go, you look for places you can dig down because all the moisture is going to be underground. So while his captors were chasing him, knowing that they didn't know what he knew, he kept taking them deeper and deeper into the desert. And they were wondering, when are we going to catch this dude, man? We're getting low on water but they were so set on destroying this man that got away that finally they got to a place where all of them died in the desert and he made it to safety. So God will teach us things in the desert. He'll teach us like in Pharaoh following them that the enemy can't follow you to a place God gave a word for you. That's why he tries to get us off track. God says, I'm going to take you here. I'm going to take you there. And we worry about the enemy pursuing us while we're going there. Stop looking back and start looking forward. Because wherever God says he's going to take you, that means the devil can't go. Because he never wants to take us where the enemy is. He's trying to take us away from the enemy. But the greatest enemy is called trusting God. See, Moses came out of the desert and he thought, why would God take us to the Red Sea? Can't nobody swim through that. But he didn't know God had a plan to open up the Red Sea. Wow. See, you and I got to get to a place sometimes where you get to a rock and a hard place and realize that God led you there because he wants to show everybody who he is in your life. My God, that's good. So every part of the Bible is necessary. That's why it's so important for you and I to read it. If you don't read it, then you don't have it in you. Now I do know we're in the city. Some people, honestly, they can't, they don't put words together well. Sometimes I say, okay, you read this. And they'll be like, hmm, and then it. And I realize they struggle with reading. Well, if you struggle with reading, listen. You gotta learn how to compensate for something you don't have. Mm -hmm. If you can't read, then listen. Yeah, yeah. I do both. I read, but I go to yeah. bed with the headphones in. I let yeah. the audible Bible talk to me. I wake up and yo, know, even Gail. Gail was snoring like blood. I say, Gail, read. She couldn't hear me because she had the headphones on. Let the. I said, Oh, I like that. I ain't gonna disturb her. She let that word get deep in her spirit. Even their soul. You know the problem with our soul, Ray? Is that our soul is still damaged. Our spirit man is perfect. When you got saved, your spirit man was perfect, but your soul was damaged. Can I tell y'all something? Most of the time when we're renewing our mind with the word of God, the reason we have to renew it is, is because our mind got to catch up with where our spirit already been. We're perfect in our spirit, we're just not perfect in our soul. Our soul's been wounded. Raise your hand if you've been through a broken relationship before. Well, they call it broken relationship because when it breaks, it frays something in it. Anybody ever been at the threat of divorce? Because of, amen? We've all been there because we, we didn't see no foreseeable. Come on, I know some people say, well, I ain't going to get divorced. But we certainly ain't close. Coming home angry every day. You used to have his and hers wash rags, now you got his and her beds. <laughs> right? Our soul's been wounded. So Jesus said, I got to give you something that will kill a wounded soul. That's why we come here on Sunday nights. We ain't just sitting here occupying a chair. I know sometimes when God's really talking to people, I can see people that 
tripping like, ooh. The worst thing you can do is not allow the Holy Spirit to challenge you to take a look at yourself and where you are in God's plan. Don't ever let yourself get duped by the enemy and by the flesh to think that you don't have to think about God's plan for your life. Because there's a thing that they say even in the world today. Anybody who fails to plan tries to fail. They had come out of Egypt. They were originally said to be free for a purpose. Why did the Bible say God let them out of Egypt? Because they were crying? No, many preachers said, well, they was crying and then God had that. No, you know what God said he wanted to let them go for? Read the Bible. God said, I want to let them go, Paul, because I want them to build a place to worship me in the wilderness. That's why God... We think God just let us out because, oh, I was crying. You know what I was going through, God. You know how my family treated me. You know how my dad treated me. You know how he left us and all that. God didn't save you for that. God saved you to worship. Amen. He'll heal everything else. He'll take care of everything else. Yes. yes, yes. In Exodus 7, 16, God warned Pharaoh to let him go. But Pharaoh didn't believe it because God didn't tell him. Who told him? Moses. Yeah. Yeah. Moses. I grew up with Moses. I taught Moses how to ride a horse and all of a sudden he went up an epiphany and act like he belongs to something else. He's adopted. Why is he trying to act like he runs something around here? So God said, and Moses was smart. Moses said, wait a minute. This dude talked about a horse. This dude was out there. All this fun stuff we did growing up. He ain't going to believe me. Who am I going to say sent me? God? He said, no. Say that I am. I said, you know what that means? That's a big word. I am means a constant state of victory. That, that's a constant state of victory. I am. Because that means he's everything we need. Amen? When I feel like I'm alone, guess what? I am. I am what? There. Most people don't care about if God's there until they go through a problem. How would you no. feel if somebody came to your house? I would say this. What if somebody came to your house and never paid attention to you? Oh, mm. Right? You open up the door. Oh, it's so good that you come in. And, everything. and then they come in. They'll pay no attention to you. They talk to everybody but you. Wow. Ain't that what people do when they come to church? They come to his house, talk to everybody but him. Oh, God. Their attention's on everybody but him. Come on. Whose house you in? God. Who should be the focus? God. Who does your personal house belong to? God. Who should be the focus? God. Then why don't my house at home look like the house here? Come on. Come on. The wilderness is where they were supposed to learn to trust God. They had cried out to God for 400 years. Now he responded. And they couldn't even trust them once he responded. Ain't nothing worse than coming to the altar, Manny, Pastor Manny, and people are crying out to God. But then when God responds, God, help me, I'm drowning. And God said, give me your hand. Yeah, uh, no, I'm not ready to that type of commitment yet. But you're going to drown. I'll take my chances, Lord. I know you're too good of a God to just let me sit here and drown. I am. That's why I said, give me your hand. But I'm not ready for that type of commitment yet. I know if I give you my hand, then I have to give you me. Which means some of us are just satisfied with dating Jesus. Wow. You know Jesus? Yeah, I see him on the weekends. Wow. In Exodus 16, they were brought to the desert. Look at the place they were brought to. Some call it sign. Some call it sin. It's S-I-N. I'm going to call it sin tonight. They came to the part of the desert called sin. They complained all day about food and how they used to be able to eat it whenever in Egypt. Ain't nothing worse than not understanding that Satan will let you be free in bondage. Yeah. All we see is that people have the ability to live a life where they accept structure, slavery, but they have no discipline. Wow. They had a desire to eat any 
time they wanted, and when they didn't see the next meal coming, they said to the leader of God, it was better for us in Mama. I've heard people come to church and I ain't lying. I wanted to just do a WWE, just run up, drop kick. Them. Bah! How are you going to say it was better in the world? My Lord. Because they said, well, it's better in the world. People in church are so mean. Well, listen, like begets like. When y'all was talking about everybody else, y'all was a little quick. You had it. Oh, you love church when they hated who you hated. But now they done turned on you. They repented. They're trying to live right. Now you ain't got nobody to live wrong with. So now this is the wrong place. Ain't no love here. No, not the kind of love you like. Ain't no flesh love here. Spiritual love. We love that the Lord has saved us. See, Amen. when you love that the Lord has saved you, it makes you look at your brother or sister different. Yeah. You yeah. start to thank God. You start to say, where is brother, where's sister righteous? She used to sit right here. I haven't seen her for two weeks. And, you know, and, and you say, well, what's her phone number? You got her phone number? Yeah, well, give me her phone number. I will call sister righteous. You know what? I know if she gets caught out there again, she may not make it back. But then some of us, all we like is the activities we get in the name of Jesus. Oh, we love to travel. We love having a carefree, commitment-free life. Some of you are committed to Sundays as if you're doing God a favor. But you forgot every day without God was like hell for you. So now you try to barter and bargain and get God to give you some days to yourself and call it family day. That same family that was all broken until Jesus showed up. My friend, guess what days you don't get to have to yourself? You don't get to have Sundays and Wednesdays for sure. But if you're young and part of the gang, that means you don't get your Fridays either. But I'd rather give God three days and he let me have four than all my days be broken because I want my own days. I'll That's pick right. what days I want to be with you, God. Not Come you on. pick what days you want to be with me. Come on. Come on. So the ability to know they were going to eat every day is what turned them off with God. And so God said, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. It's a shame that God got to come down and please us. He said, here's what I'm going to do. Just so you can have the security that it's going to be all right. You're going to eat every day. I'm going to give manna on schedule. Manna! They said manna. You know what manna is called? The definition of manna is called what is it? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I'm going to eat this. Corn flakes with no sugar on it. <laughs> then he said, I can only have a certain amount each day. But you know there's always one that tries to hide it. Maybe put that under. Put it under there for, for Moses come over here. Y'all living right? Moses, we doing everything. We bless God and favor doing everything the Lord said. And you know what the Lord said? Y'all little lives. That's why when you go check on it, it turned to worms. He said, by you only getting it when I give it to you each day, it makes you depend and trust that I will deliver like I said. See, some of us, you ain't getting what you want because God's teaching you that he can deliver. I hate when people want to preach because they can study and deliver something, but they don't know God. They don't know God. Come on. Because soon things go wrong, they want to give up. Yeah. That tells me you have an argument, not an experience. When you've had an experience with God, you just can't give up. Yes, it gets tough. Yes, but you know what? You know I'm driving out here, but all that i got to do is call on the rock. Matter of fact, yes. calling on the rock means to speak to the rock. What did Moses do to give them something to drink? Up to the rock. No, when he struck the rock, he got in trouble. That's what a lot of us do. We strike the rock. We're going to force something out. Because we ain't in the right place, right state of mind. He said, just speak. There's spiritual laws. Let me teach you a couple. Here's one. You can remember this one. You'll be blessed forever. Asking you. I tell you what fathers do, right? That girl back there, Victoria, she's so smart. I'll be trying to give her a couple bucks to go to Walmart. Hey, man, when y'all see me at Walmart, man, if I don't look like I'm happy, it's because she came with me. Hey, because, you know what? I say, oh, here's 20. That should be enough. And when I was young, didn't nobody give me 20. I had to steal 20. Hey, man, here's 20. She's like, oh, no, 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 no. You go and pray for what you mean? You don't want to. No, just come on, follow me. So here I am, like some sacrifice. 
<laughs> you know why? She realized that. Why am I going to ask my father something? I just let him go with me. And when I see something that I feel I need, I know he'll take care of it. So she's coming in richer than everybody. She's, look, my capacity is her capacity. Yeah. See, Pray. I'm trying to preach to you Don't that. If that. you can just believe that when God is with you, whatever he can do is what's possible come for you. Come on, come on, come on. Amen. Preach that. You don't get frustrated when you feel like you're going without me. You say that. Why did God even save me to put me through all this? Yeah. No, he's trying to teach us the spiritual law. Asking you. Shall you reap what you sow. If you knock on the door. It'll open. Seek and you will. Fine. You know, some people seek. Oh, seek. Does that mean I got to get up off the couch? Amen. I just kind of thought Jesus was going to do that Revelation 3.20 thing where he knocked at the door or something. Jesus, let you come on in. We don't want to go out. We want him to come over. They only have to take so much care each day. All God was trying to teach him is I'll give you enough each day, but I will make sure there'll be times where you'll have overflow. You know, there's ways to have overflow with God. Complaining is not one of them. Right. Amen? Yeah. All right. I got me a praise from a baby here. It's like, hey, that's a word. <laughs> overflow. I'm going to do what his daughter did. Amen. Daddy, let's go to the store. When she tell me to go to the store, I ain't like, I panic. I start getting all panicky. I'm like, man, I just got blessed. Uh, that was supposed to be my two room, but not ours. <laughs> you know? Come on. It's crazy because on the sixth day, Kenny, they would get a double portion. I could live like that. If I knew I was going to get a double portion every Sunday, I mean, I don't miss now, but I really wouldn't miss at all. I didn't miss when we were just brothers. He knew, he, he knew us. Cause we got saved and they came a year, year and a half later. I mean, I'm. The only time I think we missed church when my kids knew. Victoria wasn't born yet, but when we missed, it's just because me and Gail had an argument that we couldn't have rep. We never missed. <laughs> they knew something was wrong. Oh, you missed the church? It's serious. Oh, some of y'all can miss church and nobody say nothing, huh? <laughs> Mama, we missed the church today? Yes. Yay! <laughs> It'd be the day. Listen, I'm going to tell your kid, the day your mama want to miss, going to end up being one of those days when Jesus returns. My God. I bet you won't be saying yay there. <laughs> <laughs> right? We teach our kids to act like God's only there to give us something when we have a need. My God. But God forbid we have a relationship where we're submitted under whatever he wants. Right. Seven days out of the week, we come all day on Sunday. We come for a couple hours on a Wednesday. And it seems like some people struggle with that. They want to have all the family events on church days. Whatever happened to Saturday? What'd you do Saturday? Lay around and just be a thuggish, ruggish bone? <laughs> Sarah did nothing. Lazy bone. Uh, flesh bone. Uh, 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 yeah, flesh bone. Whoever they are, I just saw their names. It was crazy, man. You know what's crazy, too? Some of us have become spiritual terrorists. <laughs> Real. We assassinate every plan of God for our life. I'm going to start calling you Osama Ben Lazy. Damn. Right? Well, when you're at church, well, me and the family had a family day. Now I'm going to call you Osama Ben Lion. Now, I know we don't do that here because for some reason, I think God really draws us and we realize I have to be there. Amen. Amen. <laughs> people always say, I get people every day, every church service, God touches their heart. Four or five people come up, give it. You can count on me to be here. I'm like, all right. I believe God's doing something. Amen. But don't focus on trying to be here. Get involved so that you have responsibility here. Yes. Your responsibility ain't to find the best seat. Maybe right. you're called to be an usher where your responsibility is to help someone find a good seat that didn't know God. And it's the first, a few, first few times here. See, as long as that's your seat, that means that there's a seat that somebody that needs it can't sit down. We're going to keep seat open. 
Remember I said we're going to keep the seat open for the witness. The one that will come in the church and say, God's doing some great things. Let me go and tell everybody. Yeah. Can keep one for the weary. Yes, the one that comes in and just says, man, I don't know if I can go any further. Yeah. But keep one for the one that loves to worship God. Yeah. I don't mind when people worship God. They look at that. They, they, he shouldn't do all that. Yes, he should. You just feel bad because he stepped out the boat and you're afraid. Hello. Church has got to always have an open seat. But guess what? you got to imagine someone sitting there that has a need. They complain. Numbers 20, verse 6 says, So Moses and Aaron went out from the presence of God to the assembly, of the, the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Isn't that something? They, they, they show reverence to the point where God said, Let me show up. See, a lot of people, they don't have the fear of the Lord no more. I ain't talking about fear like you're scared of God. I'm talking about reverence for God. We lost the reverence of God. When you lose the reverence of God, here's how you can tell you lost it. You have reverence at church, but not in private life. Right. They fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then verse 7, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water from, for them from out the rock, and give the drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rock from before the Lord as he commanded him. God sustained them for 40 years. That means Moses and God had a ritual together. See, there's a difference between having a ritual at the church and a ritual with God. Having a ritual at the church, most times people are doing things in the name of God. But when you have a ritual with God, you're doing things in God. Right. In Him. Because it says we have our being in Him. We're existential beings. We don't just exist, we have life. God gives us life. Drugs and alcohol were just a way of the enemy poking holes in our life to drain it from us. God said, let me restore, let me clean you and make you a new vessel that don't have those same holes. They were sustained 40 years because they were eating that spiritual food and drinking from that spiritual rock. That pure, that pure bread, that pure bread, Serena, pure. That's that, that's that good, good. Amen, that's that one, right there. That's it. When it came down, if all, I tell you, I'd be thinking about stuff. I'm saying, well, if it came down, you couldn't say none. You see the Weathers family, what are they doing? Well, we have shovels out there. I'd be stuffing so much matter for you, you'd be like, there you go. <laughs> Hey man, come on, man, you better go eat man. I'm gonna get all the man I can. I'm gonna get fat. Oh man. Heaven's bread. And some of y'all laughing, you know how we love get fat on the earth food. Hey Amen. We love eating off the king's table on the earth. But what about the spiritual food? You can eat, it's all you can eat buffet, my spiritual food. God says, eat all you want. But sometimes we eat a little bit, then we say, if I eat any more, Paul, God might ask me for a deeper commitment. So the Lord says, keep eating. No, 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 no. I'm good. Thank you for that, though. Amen. Thank you for that little bit you gave me. Why are we so afraid of commitment? You know why I think we do? Dad, I think we're, some people are afraid of commitment because it conflicts with their own schedule in Jesus' name. Some of y'all live only about four or five blocks away, and you less committed to people that live about 20, 30 miles away. Wow. They hear more than you. My God. That's crazy, huh? Yeah. That's embarrassing. Who would want to stand before God? Right. And God said, how could you let somebody come from another part of the city, take Uber, light rail, ride a bike, petition people for a ride to get there? People with disabilities get there. We look at people coming in and they got things that they need assistance and walking. Some people come in wheelchairs to get it, but they're here. 
and you can walk just fine, always on Facebook showing how great your life is, but you're the most inconsistent Christian that consistently talks about how good God is. Come on. What do you think your conversation will be with God? God sustained them for 40 years. John 6.30 says, Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform? Then we will be able to believe. What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. It's them to tell Jesus what Jesus supplied for them. What you going to do? Well, first of all, goofball, I'm going to show you that I'm the one that gave it to them. <laughs> then Jesus said, surely I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sometimes we think our little traditions are God, and it's not. Traditions are about God. That's why traditional people are so hard to break. We'd see a lot of Pharisees in heaven if it wasn't for tradition. Traditional people are so prideful. They would say, you're pr no, you're prideful, my friend. If God's a progressive God, why ain't you progress? Come on. Because when God ain't speaking to somebody, tradition becomes their God. Yeah. And if you go against tradition, then they say, you must not be one of us. Well, you must be right. I'm not one of you. And thank God I'm not. Because it was God that told the Pharisees. He said, you block the kingdom and don't enter yourselves. And you travel double the mileage to find somebody you could proselyte and make a disciple and make them double down. That's what Jesus said. What kind of conversation you going to have with Jesus when you said, well, wait a minute, I was a leader of many people. Get out of here. Take him, get, get her out of here. Them same angels that came to strengthen Jesus when he was in the garden. Those same angels that been around you and I and they worked for us at one time now have to turn on us when Jesus says, turn away from me, I do not know you. He said we were supposed to, 1 Corinthians 6, judge the angels. Now angels have to be used for us in judgment because we never did what God said. Just couldn't trust him. I had too much going on to read that old Bible. We like little paragraphs that we can quote on Facebook. Uh -uh. But don't understand the context of what I'm yes. quoting. Come on. I just like to aim an arrow, a flaming arrow at somebody where it says, repent, you prideful people. And I got an argument with somebody at church, so I put the arrow on the thing and say, repent, you prideful people. I think I said something. But God said, you're the one that's prideful. Yes. Come on. Because less committed people are the most prideful people. Mm. When you're committed, usually you humble yourself a lot. Yeah. Wow. For a disclaimer, Michael, I bet they all looking at you. The family has something they have to do, something we already talked about. Because I see everybody like, they're leaving. They're leaving because we already talked about it. They have somewhere to be <laughs> at 8.30. So don't be looking like, look, some of y'all like, oh, okay. Amen. Did you see Mike and them got up and walked out. Uh -uh. No, they did. <laughs> see how people assume stuff? Always yes. up to somebody. Good. See, in Spanish, what they call that, Matici? Yes. yes. There you are, looking like, acting like you're looking in the mirror to fix your hair, but you're trying to say, where are they going? Then you text, uh -uh. like you're taking notes. Did you see that? They just got up and walked out. Uh -uh. Mm, something must be going on. I knew something was going on. God gave me a word for them. <laughs> So you're going to call them later to come out. The Lord says you don't have to walk away like that. He showed me that you've been going through a lot. You've been talking to your wife wrong and all that. What are you talking about? We told Pastor we had somewhere to be, but we would leave at 830. Well, that ain't what the Lord showed me. Then you better figure out who the Lord is then. Because that's the way it happened. And you know, people say, I got a word for you. Because they saw you messing up. I saw you arguing and the Lord showed me something. Right? Why didn't the Lord show me something when you was arguing? I'd love for somebody to come up and tell me the Lord showed me when I was arguing with my wife. 
But it's always the other way. Right. The Lord began to show me something. I remember, you were arguing. He showed me an ugly thing. You had a black trench coat on. It was dark all around you. Demons had pitchforks and they were aiming at you like this. And it wasn't to keep you in. It was to keep something away from you. And the Lord, I'm like, man, get out of here. I don't want to hear all that stuff. And somebody told me that my reach is going to be like an octopus. Tentacles everywhere. I said, hey, that's ugly. Man. I don't want to reach like that. I don't want to be no octopus. I just want to be saved. Right? That's what he told me. Oh, you know, I'm telling you this, but that's what people will do. They'll disrupt the God in you with these ill prophecies. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm not trying to live like that, bro. <laughs> Reaching out tentacles. You know? That's ugly, ain't it? Scared me. I went home and repeated. I said, Lord, if there's anything in me like an octopus, forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's no such thing as an octopus anointing. <laughs> I knew they were trying to say this prophecy. You're going to reach all over it. The all over the city. Your reach is going to grab them and pull them in. It was just ugly. I didn't feel good about it. And I said, you know, thank you. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. Did you meet some other people? Don't prophesy. <laughs> Two things we need. Two things we need naturally <clears throat> to sustain life is bread and water. This was crazy. You go 40 days without bread and live. You can't go more than three days without water. That's something, huh? Mm -hmm. How many agree that's something, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so maybe you did in church today because you've gone the last three days without reading your word, which is called the water of life. Mm. You say the church, I ain't growing at that church. No, you ain't growing at that church because you ain't reading at that church. <laughs> Verse 48, he said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, but they dead now. <laughs> I told you, Jesus ain't no joke. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the wilderness, but they dead now. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and never die. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to quarrel amongst each other, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? There were cults back then with cannibalism. Yeah. Amen. So anybody that don't know God assumes that they're associated with something in the world. Yeah. Like we're going to cook Jesus tonight. <laughs> Eat pieces of Jesus in order to be saved. Because they don't have a spiritual revelation. They only look at things according to the human situation. Then Jesus, verse 53 says, most assuredly, he's always assuring people, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Because they didn't believe in him, they struggled and couldn't understand him. We're speaking about spiritual food and spiritual drink that we partake of by faith every time we do this in remembrance of him. People in Jesus' time, as far back as in the desert, had wounded souls from the abuse they had in slavery. They had really had no commitment. You really couldn't commit your whole feelings to your wife because they would rape your wife all the time. So you really couldn't let yourself totally put your trust that you wouldn't be hurt in the future by claiming this is the only one that you will love until you die. So even the people there might have taken someone as a wife, but wasn't committed only to that person as a wife. Because whenever somebody hurts you, you start looking for security somewhere else. It's the same thing today. It's so easy to get divorced. It's so easy to cheat. 
because you're so worried about getting hurt if you put your soul security trust into one man or one woman. But God said it's possible if you just put your trust in me. See, whenever somebody can't trust their wife or whenever somebody can't trust their husband, what you're really saying is you don't trust God. You don't pray. You ain't reading your Bible. There's people that said they pray, but don't trust each other. Then that means you're in prayer. You're at prayer, but not in prayer. That means that there's something about Jesus you don't understand. And you put your feelings before his promise. So there's some things we have to put our focus on together. If I'm married, when you get married, Frankie, are you married? And when you get married, we don't cry when you get married. Amen. You don't know graduate the home. But there's some things that when you're married, if you want your marriage not to be smooth, but to be built, you both have to focus on Jesus. You both have to focus on you. You can't focus on, well, you know what? Let me, I'm, right now, Pastor. Sister Gail, you know, we got married, so we're going to be less committed this first two years because we're going to be at home right. building our marriage. Right. We're really going to be at home being lazy, yep. arguing and fighting because you both don't have your attention on God. Amen. Right. Your intentions are just sitting at home, now legally, fulfilling the flesh in a different right. way. Right. right? We adults here, though, that's real. Happens all the time. Yeah, The reason we struggle today is because of the abuse from yesterday. Mm. When we were slaves to sin, there was a belief system. Now watch, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm just taking my time. There was a belief system that the abuse built in us. It's a way we see things that was built in us from the abuse. But also, stand up if you were a drug addict before, before Christ. Stand up. I'm already standing. Stand up if you're a drug addict before Christ. Alcoholic. Stand up with him. Come on. Don't be afraid. Stand up. He was an alcoholic and drug addict. All your back. All your back is back in here. Don't worry. He said he's going to put you in the chair afterwards. Hallelujah. The reason I say look at this. Oh, some of y'all try to act like you drink or get up. Come on, man. When are you going to get off that train, man? You know, good and well, we know what you do. God knows what you do. You try to look like something you ain't. That's the problem. You misdiagnose who you think you are, and then you end up living a life that was never you. Mm. The reason I say that is for this purpose. Just like abuse creates a way you believe that you bring into Christ, so the drugs and alcohol. It's called an artificial world that we lived in while we were drug addicts and alcoholics. There's a way we perceive things. Yeah. That the drugs opened us up to a certain types of demons that were able to speak to us. That didn't get to speak to people that weren't drug addicts because the word drug is the word, you know, we call it sorcery, right? Which is the word pharmacia, we call it the pharmacy. It means altered state of being, gateway. So there's voices we have heard that people that didn't do drugs or drug addictions didn't hear. So there was a artificial realm that we dwelled in that was different than most people. Yeah. And there was a belief system built, Pastor Matty, in that realm. Yeah. So God said, I'm going to make a ministry where those people that were drug addicts that had that artificial world that was built for them, yeah. where, the, where the devil gave us ideas all the time, yeah. but at the same time always gave us Ideas for destroying ourselves and people around us. You know how many of us were drug addicts that the drugs, the demons came and told us to cheat on each other when none of us had actually cheated yet. To hurt one another when we ain't even really hurt each other yet. To believe certain things that ain't even happened yet. And then it became part of a culture when we did it too long. Now we belong to an artificial culture. Where everybody, remember, I remember when I first got saved, I told somebody I, uh, the longest I was up was six days. Man, I heard so many voices. One told me to kill Gail and all that stuff. Everybody was laughing, right? I've been up like that too for six days. <laughs> Come on, six days? God didn't correct nobody to be up for six days. How many voices got in? 
Right? Think about how many voices ever for six days in your pastor. I'm the first six. I already look got big eyes. Can you imagine how big my eyes was there? <laughs> huh? And I was skinny too. Talk about you look like you on something. I ain't on nothing. But I'm perfectly fine. If I am on something, I can put it in time because I'm in control. Right? There's an artificial world that you have to be delivered from tonight. See, that Satan thought he could hide. Thought he could hide. Well, we'll just treat them like everybody else. Well, we ain't like everybody else. Because you got to realize that there was a realm that we entered through drugs. That people who didn't do drugs did not enter. Artificial. Artificial. It seems official, but it's artificial. Come on. And you know what happens? We get saved and we start coming to church. Victory Outreach, a place created for people that was, not, it's created for everyone, but especially for people that were subject to that realm. Mm -hmm. And we say, why can't they just get it right? See, nobody could ever help us get it right because never ever knew there was another realm that we entered. So God had to make a special place where he could deliver us. Those hidden things. Yeah, yeah. Remember 2 Corinthians 4 talked about the hidden things. Yeah. Hidden means it's hiding. It's funny how some preachers can't find it. They just say, something's wrong with you. You got to flow. You got to get it together. That's because you don't understand that realm. Now thank God I do. Because I understand that realm, I don't want to come and look for you. Mm. See, we were addicts. Say addicts. Yes. We had addictive spirits. Addictive nature. So the problem is, one of the things about us is that once we begin to start to do something again, if we do it more than a few times, we get stuck in it. So if I stop coming to church a few times, I get stuck. People don't understand. I'm not trying to stay away. I'm just still got an addictive nature. Once you get into a wrong relationship, it seems like all the other ones get wrong too. Because you still got the same addictive nature they don't understand. It's not that I just want a man or I just want a woman. Like I just want to be with someone. I don't understand what's wrong. It's the addictive nature. Mm -hmm. That spirit of addiction still follows us quietly. Mm -hmm. And then we say, be addicted to ministry. Uh-uh. Yeah. Come on. Because Paul said that in 1 Corinthians. He said that he was, you know, addicted to ministry basically. But Paul, they did hide. We did. So Paul would, would say to us, Apostle Paul would say, when I said that, I was just saying, occupy your life with something good over God rather than the things you used to right, do in the world. Right. To see some of us are addicted still to anger. I should hear a shout. Yeah. Amen. Uh, you're still addicted to anger. Do you know that anger allows certain toxins? We heard it before. To stay in your body longer than God anticipated. He said, don't let the sun go down on your anger. That means, hey, listen. You let the sun go down on your anger. Scientific fact that those 1,400 toxins are working in your body. Just because you don't feel nothing now don't mean you won't see something later. What about the jealous spirit? Some people argue to death to guard that jealous spirit. rather than You know what? You know you got jealous spirit? Because I've been affected by that spirit before. Me and my wife used to fight all the time. Because we burned each other in the world and been burned by people in the world. We come to Christ. We start acting the same way without growing, not being able to identify what was, you know, on us. And so every time if I would say something to you, you somebody that, you know, I might go to you because maybe I might say, well, you know what? I just wanted to encourage this woman. But she'd be ready to fight me and you because she thinks I'm over trying to get at you. Or if I go in the store, there we are with a jealous spirit, taking a look at the book racks without you saying you're looking at the dude on the book. Or the girl. You have a jealous spirit and you need to be delivered. It ain't the person next to you. It's you right. and what's on you. Yes. <laughs> That's why God said jealousy and envy. Envy means that you look at other men and other women in the church and you try to outdress them. When you can't outdress them, you get upset with them. There's people in the church that, why are they preaching? Why are you always looking at that person's husband or that person's wife? Such an envious person. With, uh, that just shows your low self-esteem. Yes. Mm -hmm. Come on now. 
always blaming somebody else for the way you are. Or what did I used to do? I would just ignore her. Go out in public and, and we could have a good time and would just totally ignore her because that spirit would come and tell me that I know deep down inside she ain't right. So we're supposed to be out having a good time. And don't let these spirits dictate how I'm going to be out in the good time. You can never have a good time because they won't leave you alone. Because they came in in that realm. So, I, mean, I know some of y'all ain't going to stand up. That's all right. That's why you're in the situation you're in. Always blaming somebody else. You know you smoke. We, some of you, you're you in the home. We pulled you into the home because of your drunk self and your get high self. But you don't come to church always faking the funk. Never can face who you are so God can change what you've been. I always think you know the word of God but can't live it. You can't live it. You can't give it. Who trying to disciple your wife when you ain't being discipled? Who trying to tell your husband how he should be, but you ain't got no example that you listen to about being a wife? People in the wilderness, I'm almost done. Stay up. I know you stand for movies. You can stand for this. Hey Amen. You know I'm standing popcorn. I saw some of us there. I was counting too. I, I hit my time. Quick like. I was like, they didn't even complain it because why? They anticipate getting that popcorn with that three layers of butter and that drink and that Angus hot dog and all that. Hey, man, we were standing up. Uh, we're all movie buddies that we be. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> hey, man, being there for 45 minutes, standing up, ain't said nothing. Uh, uh. Come to church. Brian, well, Pastor, God, it's been four minutes. I've been standing. Because sometimes I just need to get you off your blessed assurance. <laughs> I need to get you off your heavenly assets. <laughs> People in the wilderness ate manna, drank drink from a rock. God sustained their health. He sustained everything. He preserved them in the desert that people normally couldn't survive. God will bring you through. But how you go through, man, shows the honor toward God. Can you say amen? amen. They were saved from Pharaoh, but not delivered from themselves. The man that healed their bodies. The water kept them refreshed. The blood was used to give them new life when they, when, whenever they were out there. And God had to do, you know, when they were at the doorpost, remember they slayed, they put some, some blood on the door. Blood gave them new life. You know why it gave you new life? Because you can say, well, that's the same on me. No, it wasn't. That, that, that destroying angel came to destroy. But it didn't come to your house. If you wake up in the morning... And everybody else died last night. You got new life, my friend. You better realize something needs to change about me today. Yeah. The word renews your mind. I'd ask you a question. Is anybody in here suffering from cancer, diabetes, arthritis, or any type of sickness or disease? Because if you are, I'm tell you something. You can't find none of that in Jesus. If it wasn't in the body of Jesus, it shouldn't be in the body of Christ. But we've got to let God reveal the environment that he set on earth through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God coming down to fill us. See, your healing is not on the outside. Your healing is on the inside. It was always there waiting. It was waiting for you and I to release our faith that God never intended for me to be sick. See, sometimes we've allowed things to attach itself to us. But there's other times we allow the bloodline that I'm from, which is so deficient in so many areas. You know when you still live by your bloodline? When people say, well, my mama used to do it this way or my daddy used to do it this way, so that you act just like them. Like it's a good thing. Like, well, you can see who my daddy is. No, that's a bad thing. Especially your daddy don't serve God. You need a different example. God didn't say, he said, honor your mother and father in all situations. But he didn't say, make them an example in all situations. And he went up, the Holy Spirit came down. I'm going to have to move this up here because we're about to take communion. Amen. Where's our, is our ushers? Oh, ooh, they're coming with the golden dishes. <laughs> you know, we got to make it look like it's from heaven. <laughs> oh. Look at that. That's gold. Ooh, thank you, usher from heaven. 
This Billy, huh? Billy shiny, look, Billy. I, I, I had an experience ahead. right now when they look at it. Billy got the golden chalice. Like, that's what he said, I'm going to do this in heaven. Be a doorkeeper. And when we're going to take communion in Jesus, you stand there, there's Mike. OG, triple OG, Mike. Fullest town, amen. Fullest. He loved the Lord, though. I ain't gonna lie. Amen. That's right. I can see That's that OG right. go through some stuff. Come on. But at the end of the day, I'm gonna go off what I see, not what people say. Yes. Amen. Glory. You want to pass? Everybody got something? You want to pass that out to everybody? Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and read this as I as they pass. Now listen. <laughs> communion. I remember one time a church member said, "You can't take communion if you've been if you've been sinning and making mistakes." I said, why do we always got to put conditions on anything to get closer to Jesus? I wouldn't have nobody do communion without me first, allowing the Holy Spirit to convict us about who we've been. I would not take communion and begin to read the scripture without us first having the opportunity to repent, meaning make another choice. I wouldn't do that. See, first of all, to really see clearly who Jesus is and what he's done for you and I, we need our minds clear. We need to, we, we need our minds clear. So I have to give some word to kind of like, say, hey, look, he loves us. I've been in some dry places and Jesus was still there for me. Amen. Can I hear a loud amen? Amen. Uh, that was a church out there in the desert. It was a church on the move, but they weren't going nowhere. Wow. See, people always say church on the moon, but sometimes the church going in circles. That ain't movement. Wow. That's circles. Dang. A church on the move is headed toward its destiny. It certainly ain't the church. The church on the move ain't the one Moses had. The church on the move is the one Joshua led. Come on. The one that they crossed the Jordan yeah. and stepped into the promised land. See, we so big on our past. That's why everybody ain't got nothing sometimes but a good testimony. Come on. Because you're in the Moses area of your life. Wow. The Bible talks about Moses, my servant, is dead. Meaning what he was supposed to do, his assignment's over. So many people, you know, they, they, they get saved. In other words, God pulls them out, but they don't get delivered. Mm. He pulls them out of Egypt, but can't get the Egypt out of their heart. Come on. So you've got to move into a new era, a new season with God. To get to a place where you know you ain't the same because you ain't going to be living the same. You ain't going to be doing the same thing. You're going, you can't stay involved for, let's say there's seven days and you committed one day to God since you got saved. Then you're the same if you didn't commit to at least two or three. When I take communion, I always remember how me and her <laughs> We were homeless. I'm walking with one of them. I hate carrying one of those things. You know how flea market is good for you to carry one of them black wire baskets? Well, I, I was shaking and get nervous because I remember the past where we got, remember we got uh, the sheriff blocked us off from going back in the house. We were so far out there in Dauphine Lab. That, and I remember walking down the street, right? With one of those. I said, man, I was supposed to play pro basketball. They paid for my college for free. Here I am. I look at my life. Why, why, what's going on? Obviously, I wasn't saved, so I blame Gail. It's her fault. She never hooked up with her. It's crazy. Cause I worried about if I hooked up, but it seemed like I couldn't leave her, so I was hooked in. See, wow. God let us separate in a hard time. Mm -hmm. So even when we have a hard time in Christ, I ain't going nowhere. Yeah. Right. Because I realized he saved us with a purpose. Come on. So I take communion and I remember what he's done for me. Yeah. That he could have just left me out there to die. But he's not got a plan for you. Yes. Got a plan for Gail. No matter what y'all go through, you've seen hard times when I was there. How dare you act like I ain't gonna be there when, when you actually gave your life to me and now I'm responsible for you, uh, responsible for you even more. See, before I was responsible to you by the prayers of other people. Valerie praying for Gail, my mama praying for me and stuff like that. See, I was responsible by prayer, but now I'm responsible by relationship. How Amen. dare you think I won't be there? Amen. So when we do communion, we do this in remembrance. Of him. 
Don't ever forget what he's done for you, what he's done for me, man. Don't ever forget what he's done for us. Oh, every time I get a little too lofty, I look back and say, wow, he could have lost me. Not because he wasn't strong, but because I couldn't see. Right. Could see the whole time God loved me and had a plan for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, so I don't worry about, you know, sometimes well, I, I might communicate it wrong, but I pray for my wife every night because my job is to not throw her under the bus, but to cover her. Now, I don't mean that sometimes we ain't going to have a disagreement, might argue a little bit. That's human. I hate when people come and act like, we don't argue at home. Well, either you lord over your wife and you got her so scared to say anything because a human sometimes disagrees on different levels. Sometimes if you can't agree on the first level, it goes to the second level. Then we, <laughs> you can't agree on the second level, it goes to the third level. Usually by the fourth level, you text a sister girl or text a pastor because we're on the fourth level of disagreement. If it goes to five, somebody might not be alive. <laughs> First Corinthians eleven twenty three says, For I pass to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. He gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. He took the cup. The cup was the blood. He said, This is the new covenant between God and his people. And agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthily manner is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. What is an unworthy manner? You and I standing here knowing we've been hurt by somebody somewhere. Just because they're out of sight don't mean they're out of heart. And we're going to realize, no matter what they do to us going forward, I'm a vessel that has to forgive. Yes, it will hurt. But because my Lord has forgiven me for all the things I've done, I surely will forgive them. See, that's if I can't do that, then you're taking it in an unworthy manner. And then there's, there's repercussions for taking. Because you're saying you're doing something in remembrance of God. So if God forgave and we don't forgive, then we're presenting God in the wrong manner. So the body he's talking about is not just his body, but the body of Christ. Right. Not just those that are here, but those that should be here or one day will be here. See, a lot of us come from past relationships. A lot of us in here got kids from other people too. Sometimes we act like because of the stress of life they put on me that we don't realize that we may have some unforgiveness for that old relationship and it doesn't come out until something about you comes out. And uh, you know what, there's all kinds of stuff that people in relationship I've been with before can say, but I know I'm not that person no more. I have a wife to love. I have some kids to continue to raise and protect. And not just, with Victoria, I can still be an authority over her. The three boys are grown, so I just have to be an advisor to them. I can't live my life trying to be the authority over them. Right. They're grown, so now I have to move from authority to advising. Mm. And I realize that the advice I give them is what's going to make them connect with God. Being an authority over them throws them out of order. So it ain't hard for me to forgive people. Because I understand what forgiveness is. It doesn't mean we got to go fishing together. It doesn't mean I'm going to hang out with you. It doesn't mean every time you say something about me, I've got to say something mean about you. We got our own life to live. Me and her, we got we're too busy doing what stuff at church worry about other stuff. So when things do come in, we take opportunities like this, all of us, to repent, to change our mind about the events that we've been through. I would give you 10 seconds to think about some people you might have to choose to forgive tonight. The same way repentance is a choice, a decision. Forgiveness is the same thing. It's a decision that, Lord, no matter what she or he has done to me, I forgive. Because we're inner city. Some of us were taken advantage of, but we got to forgive. Amen. Some of us have broken relationships from the past. My wife had relationships before me. I hate that anybody, because I knew she was always meant for me, but I also had relationships myself, and we got to put our past behind us. But sometimes our past tries to creep back in through certain ways, and we cannot let it change the way we follow, which is Christ. Yeah. 
Some of us got to forgive our fathers for not being there. Because we come to church and say, what? Well, we say, Heavenly Father, we'll follow Jesus, but not Heavenly Father. Why? Because our earthly father, we have such a bad relationship that the word father sends me in a shock whenever you say it. I don't even know how to be a son because it's not, I ain't never had a father. Well, that's why God has spiritual fathers in the church. They represent us being a father to the fatherless. Yeah. But a father can't nurture all the time. So you know what I said? You need a spiritual mother because mothers nurture. Yeah. Right? So who do you need to forgive? Oh, I know some of you, you've forgiven everybody, but you forgot one person, you. The only thing blocking you all this time is forgiving yourself. You know your unforgiveness for self will attack your spirit and never let you grow. You don't have to perform with God and be good. Just let good begin to work in you. Let God have his way. Forget about those past relationships. Forget about the failures in the past. And let's move forward. Let's remember what Jesus done for us. Yes. Watch this, and then I'm done. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. That is why many are weak and sick, and even some have died. But, verse 31 of 1 Corinthians 11, but if we examine ourselves, see, I'm trying to get us to look within, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. See, if God's dealing with you right now, it's because he has to. He's trying to save us. But if God ain't dealing with you, it could be because you actually looked into yourself and said, there are changes I need to make. Now, if you said there are no changes, then the devil is alive. Every man, every woman, every young person born into this world has something that has to change yes. about them at all times and at any given time. Mm -hmm. So what God wants us to do is repent, renew, and rejoice that we have the victory in him. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took some bread. Please take your bread. He said, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he took the cup after supper and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat the bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death. Until he comes for you again. Drink the cup. After, have the worship team come up for a minute, please. Just, keep, just close your eyes for a minute, cut down all the distractions. Just close your eyes and just have a moment with God. Would you think about how much he loves you, what he's done for you and me, how he saved us? what he's doing with our lives here in the local church. I know we get tired at times, but tonight was about Jesus. It's about him. It's always about him. The whole book is about him. Everything's about Jesus. What we do on the earth matters, but it's temporary. The earth actually belongs to us. Sin messed it all up. Romans 8 says the earth is waiting on the suns to appear because we bring order to something that's out of order. God gives us to practice his presence by giving us opportunities to go and see our families restored, to see our marriages restored, to 
see young people in our church go out and share the gospel with people. First of all, it's an anomaly or a phenomenon when they see somebody 23, 25, 28 giving their freedom over to God. Why are you out here, bro? You could be anywhere. You could be kicking it at the house party on Friday night. Y'all for having a gang service on Friday night? What's all that about, bro? Gives you a platform to share the gospel. Yeah. How God changed you. What God's doing in our life. See, listen, church. I don't ever want you guys to think that all is lost in your life. It's not. This is just a humble beginning for all of us. But you got to begin. You got to begin. Stop focusing on the problem and start looking at the promises. Stop worrying about the attacks and use the anointing given to you for them. We can handle any attack of life. God calls it the armor of God. Is it our armor or his armor? His armor. Okay, if he created the world and it's his armor, then he knows how to create something that the world can't pierce. Then he says, I'll give you something that conquers man. It's called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. But I thought it was to fight the devil. No. It's to conquer man. It's not to make man a slave. But it's to be able to pierce the conscience of men and women all over the world with the love, hope, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we're so afraid to talk about Jesus. If you can't think of anything, if you can't think of any scripture that comes to mind, at least talk to them about how God had loved you and I even when we were unlovable. Yes. How we come to church and we ain't even perfect yet. Come on. But we're in perfect position to be perfected by the perfect one. By his stripes, we were healed. He already took care of it before we got here. Then he, he fulfilled it and completed it on the cross. Now, by his stripes, we are healed. Where any two or three touch and agree on the thing our Father will do in Jesus' name. You got two confessions about healing that agree with each other. And God's ready to release your healing. He is, I didn't say give you healing, I said release your healing. See, faith is a key. To the kingdom. He said, I'll give you keys to open doors in the kingdom. Healing is the children's bread, the Bible says. But sometimes it's not the appetite we have. We don't have an appetite for bread. We want the meats of the past and all that stuff. And now God says, come out of that. Come out of that. Get to a place where you okay with trusting me to lead you, to provide for you, to protect you night when we took communion as much as the enemy wants to torment our minds tonight he's going to heal and make us whole spirit soul and body our souls are tormented because our mind is part of our soul sometimes you got the threat your husband don't love you your wife don't love you your mother your father don't love you your kids don't love you the church don't love you, you got all these tormenting voice haunting voices there the devil is a liar we all love each other. We just learn on different levels what love is and how to love each other. It takes time. It takes patience. But it actually takes stepping out and letting someone know you love them sometimes. Yes. Yeah. So tonight, I'm going to open up the altar for wholeness. That the healing power of God can make us whole. Because it was already for us. It's our bread. It's children's bread. We are the children of God. Come on. Just come and lift up your hands.